Shalom. Um, I can't tell you how much of an honor it was for me to be asked by the Pearl family to do this. And I want to say to them how many people said to me when they heard or read that I was coming, things that made it plain how they regarded the loss of your son as personal. Whether they were Jewish or not, whether they were Americans or not, whether they were interested in the First Amendment or whether they were journalists or not, there was something about the manner of his passing that will always remain with us. Um, if I lived in an uncivilized society, today could have been for me a kind of martyr's day. Um, I was just taken by some very courteous and gallant young cadets to see the Veterans Memorial on the other side of this campus where is commemorated Second Lieutenant Mark Daly, a young man who gave his life in Kurdistan a few years ago for the liberation of Iraq and wrote very movingly to me about it in his service and a man who I was hoping to meet and whose family I'm very pleased now to count as I now can with great pride claim the pearls as, if not family, very close friends. And I thought to myself, after I go to this memorial, I have to go and speak for Danny, but just as at Mark's scattering of his ashes, there'll be today no ululations, no wailings, no shooting in the air, no tossing of the coffin on the shoulders of a mob, no hoarse, brutal cries for revenge and suicide and murder. No, we won't have that. Instead, we'll have honest, decent, modest, brave people trying to deal with their grief and trying to apply reason to the crises that led to their deprivation. And I think that, that marks, if you like, part of the boundary between civilization and barbarism that this lecture is designed to patrol and I would say enforce. Um, at the scattering of Mark's ashes on the, a beautiful coastal spot in Oregon, I um, quoted from the last uh, scene of Macbeth, and I think I can do it again. Um, I had difficulty doing it at that time, where, as you'll recall, the tyrant is gone, the tyranny and the usurpation is over, but old Seward doesn't know it yet, but he's lost his son in this struggle. And I believe it's Macduff who has to say to him the following, and I'll address it to uh, the pearls, if I may. Um, your son, my lord, has paid a soldier's debt. He only lived until he was a man. The which no sooner had his prowess confirmed in the unshrinking station where he stood, but like a man, he died. And that's hard enough to get through, believe me. But it's Shakespeare, so it, doesn't, it isn't for the next beat or so that you get it all. As Macduff adds, your cause of grief must not be measured by his worth, for then it hath no end. That's the best tribute I can offer you, um, and I'm very acutely aware of my own debt to uh, a finer register of emotion. Now, um, one more thing. Um, this campus is where my in-laws met uh, in the 40s, one from Odessa, one from Galicia, and married. Um, as you heard, I was late in discovering some occluded parts of my heritage, and I once wrote that anyone who wanted to defame the Jewish people would, if they were doing so, be defaming my wife, my mother, my mother and father-in-law, and my daughter, so that I felt I didn't really have to say anything for myself. But I did add that in whatever tone of voice the question was put to me, whether it was friendly or hostile, was I Jewish, I would always answer yes. I, I could, the denial in my family would end with me. Um, but of course, there was the most acute possible test of that question, faced by young Daniel Pearl in the most appalling circumstances. And again, I pause to remember how proudly and how bravely and how nobly he refused uh, any sort of refuge in denial. Again, setting a standard of a Shakespearean kind that's very hard for me to approach without feeling a feeling of want of proportion. Um, I've never done this before, ladies and gentlemen, in my entire lecturing career, a dog and pony show trick, a, a visual aid, but I'm now going to ask if the 
comrades up there could cue a little clip that I want to share with you. <laughs> cue clip. Because you, you think that's your big day. Yeah. And you realize that this is an event that is so much bigger than your... Well, it's the public conversation that we had yesterday, although that's a fairly significant yeah, we're part. all connected. Yeah. All right, we will get to the Mark Christie on Jay Leno tape properly in a second, but we begin this morning. Mark's like, why is it the first thing? <laughs> well, with an unusual experience I had on Friday involving the newly returning to the screen, Mel Gibson. Now, the last time we spoke at any length about Mel Gibson, it was all bad. The summer of 2006, you'll recall, Gibson was arrested for drunk driving and reportedly during that arrest went on a slur-filled anti-Semitic tirade. That was then. This, this is now. Gibson's arrest has been expunged from his records. He completed three years of probation, paid a fine, and attended mandatory Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. He has a new movie. Edge of Darkness, that opens later this month. He stars opposite the actor Ray Winstone in the thriller. As you might recall, Ray, who was sitting next to Mel during the interview you're about to see, was in studio with us last Thursday. We all exchanged pleasantries, and well, then things got less pleasant. You tell me this has been your first film for how long? What, seven years, eight years, seven or eight years to star in, to be in front of the camera. I chose to sort of walk away about eight years ago because I felt I was getting a bit stale. And I came back with this because man, I just felt it was time to get back in the saddle. Enough time had gone by. And honestly, it was the best piece of writing I'd seen. Some people are like, people are going to welcome you back. And other people are going to be like, he should never come back. Why? Because of what happened before. What happened before? The remarks that were attributed to you. That were attributed to me. Yeah. That I didn't necessarily make. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, uh, and, and uh, I, I gather you have a, a dog in this fight. Pardon me? You have a dog in this fight? Or are you being impartial? I'm try you tell me I'm trying to be impartial, I guess. Okay. okay. Well, I'm back. And uh, I hope it works out. And I hope people will graciously accept me back. So now, when I, when I left that interview, I was mad at myself, first, to be honest, because I simply didn't initially understand what he meant when he said, do you have a dog in this fight? What's and, your interest in And then a few fight? seconds later, yeah. when I did understand, I didn't speak up and say that as, as both a Jew and as a human being, I was really offended by what he said in 2006. And while there have been plenty of reports of private apologies and making amends, it never really seemed to me that he apologized, nor, as he did when we spoke, did it seem that Gibson contested the remarks, like he didn't actually say them. So frankly, I'm still conflicted, and I should have told him. Audiences, of course, will vote with their wallets and their feet when the movie opens at the end of the month. Yeah, being defensive is not the best way to handle things sometimes, huh? I guess not. I yeah. mean, I was, uh, you know what, though, in your, in your, when you sat in front of him in your, what you didn't say said more. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah. you, you know what, uh, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Oh, God, now I've got more sound than I need. How's that? All right, now, I think from that sordid little showbiz microcosm, I can derive a little introduction to what I want to say further. Notice first the look of chubby woe on the face of the interviewer, sharing his grief with his friends later, saying, you know what, for a while back there, I could almost believe he was calling me a Jew boy. And then saying, well, perhaps he did already say the things that he said, but also look at Mel Gibson's eyes. Look at that face. Look at the way he leans in. You're looking straight into the gun barrel of what I'm talking about. And you'll observe another thing. It's quite clearly, in his case, a matter of a mental disorder. It's a pathology. And it must mean a lot to him. I mean, clinicians will tell you, those who study schizophrenia and paranoia, that anti-Semitism very often presents as a very leading symptom of this kind of crack-up. But I don't think that's it either with Mel Gibson, or not entirely. And I certainly don't think it was the booze. I, I should say that if whiskey made you anti-Jewish, the Kroll family would not have invited me to be addressing <laughs> um, What none of the questioners have ever asked Mel Gibson is, what are the origins of your furious, fanatical, decided hatred of the Jewish people? It would be very easy if he was asked to press him on this. He is a member of a Catholic schismatic faction which has its own church paid for by him in Malibu, as good a place as any for the saving of souls, I dare say. <laughs> and the guru and priest of this church is his father, Hutton Gibson, a mad idiot savant whose books I have carefully read, and of whom Mel Gibson says that he's never known this man speak an untruth. Well, very well. Let me refer you to what Hutton Gibson said about Joseph Ratzinger when he was a cardinal. He was obliged to write one of those letters the Vatican occasionally has to produce, making nice with the Jews. 
And he said, well, he did his best, barbarian bureaucrat. Um, it's a pity that the Jews don't share in our love of Christ and our feeling of the, for the Savior, and that they're excluded from his love and so forth. But we can say that they brought us monotheism and to this extent could be counted as standing in relationship to us to other as an elder brother. Okay? Not great, a bit patronizing. But not, the Catholic Church has said many worse things. Hutton Gibson's comment on this in his book? Oh yes, he said. Abel had an elder brother. Okay. I think we know, in other words, what we're talking about here. You only have to look at Mel Gibson's film, widely distributed, in a town where he must, he must care about being an anti-Semite, because it's, it, you would think no one working in Los Angeles or in Hollywood would, would make like that if they didn't really believe it, and I think he must do, where, very controversial scene in the film, only one verse in one of the four Gospels of the New Testament, the rabbinate, the Sanhedrin, calls publicly for the blood of Jesus to be on their heads down to the last generation. It's one of the first versions of the blood libel. After protests, it was cut out. Uh, not cut out, the scene is in the film, and it's spoken in either Hebrew or uh, Aramaic. Um, but when the film was distributed in the Middle East, the subtitles were put back in. And it's the only such film ever to have been distributed in the Arab and Muslim world, because normally, as you know, uh, prophets, of whom Jesus is counted as one, can't be shown on the screen, so the Arabs never got to see King of Kings, lucky them. Um, or the greatest story ever told, or I think even Ben-Hur. But Mel Gibson, they made an exception for. Can you guess why? I think you quite probably can. So there's a little microcosm just down the road from where we are met. Uh, and it, it puts me in mind of the closing staves of Albert Camus' novel, La Peste, uh, The Plague where Dr. Taru is, is thinking about how the people are celebrating, the plague seems to have gone. They've survived it, it was terrible. Uh, but people think it's been banished. He says, but the rats are still down there in the sewers, brooding. And the plague is still down there with them, and that plague will one day again send up its rats to die once more on the, on the streets of a free city. And I remember the closing passage of, of Bertolt Brecht's uh, Arturo Ui where the leading actor stands forward at the end after Hitler's gone. And the stage darkens and the, the spotlight's on him and he says, uh, this was the thing that nearly had us mastered. But do not think that that is all, uh, you men. For though we rose up and we beat the bastard, the bitch that bore him is on heat again. And no one who pays any attention to the news from the Muslim ghettos in Europe uh, to the proclamations in the Middle East, to the pronouncements of the Russian Orthodox Church, now the black cowled bodyguard of Putin's new Russian nationalist authoritarianism. Question, is Russian nationalist authoritarianism ever good for the Jews? Uh, to Ratzinger himself, now Pope, uh, restoring to the ranks the formerly excommunicated members of the Society of Pope Pius, the anti-Semites, the Holocaust deniers, the people who believe that the church should never have said that Jews were not collectively guilty for the murder of Christ. It's all coming back and needs to be confronted. It's a very bit, I'm saying anti-Semitism, this plague is very protean and very durable and very volatile. It occurs in all ages and in practically all societies, the only one I know where the Jewish people have not been persecuted is India. Um, just as you think it's been eradicated, up it pops again, it surges. It's exploded with or without the existence of a state or Israel, with or without Zionism, with or without finance capitalism, for which Jews were blamed, and with or without communism, for which, amazingly, Jews were simultaneously blamed. <laughs> um, and, of course, in parts of Poland and elsewhere, with or without any Jews at all. There are outbreaks of pernicious anti-Semitism. It's, in other words, it's quite different from other forms of racism. You sometimes read liberal proclamations against racism and anti-Semitism, as if they were distinct. Well, I don't think they are distinct in, in the sense that's implied by that, but I believe that anti-Semitism is rather the mother of, or the, perhaps better say, the godfather of all other kinds of racism. It is somewhat like a version of mental illness, as I mentioned above, and as Mr. Gibson handsomely illustrates. It's also quite like a conspiracy theory. 
Uh, it has a great appeal to the pseudo-intellectuals uh, and the partially educated. It talks about blood and gold and secret documents and forgotten protocols. Um, nobody accuses West Indians or Puerto Ricans of trying to take over the world's financial system. Normal, ordinary, everyday common or garden racism is just that, vulgar, usually based on a sexual repulsion, complaints about different kinds of cooking, who, overbreeding, who knows what. But the protocols are not like that at all. The protocols of the Elders of Zion, which I have a private campaign about, the campaign is simply this, don't ever call it a forgery. Why not? A forgery is a copy of a true bill. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion is not a forgery. There's no true bill of which it's a copy. It's a whole cloth fabrication by Russian Orthodox fascists uh, that um, is rather brilliantly based on a dialogue between Montesquieu and Machiavelli in hell about how to debauch a state. Uh, it's nothing at all to do with Zionism. Fabricated by Russian Orthodox, reprinted by, in England, by the Church of England's own publishers, and by the London Times, swallowed by almost all the Catholic world, and now available for free on the website of Hamas. Again, from this little microcosm, as with the Gibson one, you can see how the infection spreads. The Nazis thought of Poles and Slavs and Gypsies as racial inferiors by all means, but the organizing principle of their racism, the thing that gave it its energy and its consistency, uh, was the hatred of the Jew. And that was what their race fantasy was based upon. And it's a pity that even the victims of that race fantasy, Slavs and Poles, also hated the Jew. Uh, that's what makes it so horrible and so inescapable. Would it be believed by anybody if it was said that all the Armenians left the World Trade Center just before the planes hit, or all the Irish left the World Trade Center? I don't think so. It has to be the Jews. It's not exciting if it's not. It would be a mere vulgar prejudice. There's not enough, you know, traction and grit and flavor to it, unless it's the real thing. Osama bin Laden and his murderous uh, gangsters uh, by all means deem every Hindu, every Christian, all Shia, all Baha'i, all Ahmadi Muslims to be meat for slaughter, and of course all atheists and agnostics. So they've already nearly got me twice. But if you look at their propaganda and, and, and if you talk to them, as I have done to specimens of them, you'll find nothing, nothing in their worldview comes up to what they feel uh, in terms of fear and loathing about the Jew. And this seems to me to license uh, Jean-Paul Sartre's conclusion in his portrait of the anti-Semite that the outcome of anti-Semitism and the secret, not so secret desire sometimes, of every anti-Semite is murder. That it has to, this will eventuate in blood. It can't be appeased any other way, which makes it another cause of seriousness for us. So the question is, is this just one single phenomenon, with, simply with many facets? Can we isolate the bacillus? Is it possible to do that? Can we, um, I mean, to do it, the better I mean to say, to recognize it and to combat it, to identify it. Uh, can we make discriminations about it? Another word I want to rescue, by the way, is discriminate. People say that racists are guilty of discrimination. Why do they do that? Why do people say that? Discrimination is the one thing the racist can't do. The racist can't discriminate between members of another ethnic group. It's a silly thing to say about a racist, but we have to learn to discriminate and make distinctions because our survival may depend upon it, and the survival of, of civilized society, too. So I'm going to try. I've only got a little time with you before I yield myself back to your questions. I'll probably only be able to put some questions and not answer them, but believe me, I won't leave while anyone can say, I didn't answer a question. So here are some. Is anti-Zionism anti-Semitic? One's got to deal with this early, and so I'm going to. Um, Abraham Foxman, for example, of the Anti-Defamation League says, criticism of Israel of any kind is fine, but those who say that there shouldn't be a Jewish state are guilty of anti-Semitism. I think this is actually wrong on its face. Um, between Theodore Herzl's proclamation at the World Zionist Congress, the turn of the 19th century, and the Balfour Declaration, probably no one else in the world knew there was an argument about Zionism, and the only anti-Zionists were Jews. It was an argument, so to speak, within the family. 
uh, the only member of the British cabinet to vote against the Balfour Declaration and speak against it was the only Jewish member, Sir Edwin Montagu, who said he, he regarded himself as British, didn't want to be told that his proper place was in the Middle East. Um, I've spent some intensely enjoyable evenings with the Naturai Kata, uh, Satmara sect and its rabbis, who have the best arguments I've yet heard for the age of the earth being 4,300 years. Um, and who refuse to serve, in, not just refuse to serve in the Israeli army, but really believe that Zionism is a blasphemy against the Torah and an anticipation of the Messiah and should be destroyed and only recognize uh, Palestinian uh, negotiators in the, in the matter. There's a very long tradition of that kind of primitive religious anti-Zionism among Jews also. And there were, per contra, there were some anti-Semites, uh, Sir Oswald Mosley was one of them, who were quite keen on Zionism because they thought, I don't care where the Jews go as long as they go. Um, but they would have preferred Madagascar. Um, so Roswell Mosley's very nasty wife, who I had a quarrel with once in print, was very vicious about this. Said they, must, they can go anywhere they like, but they're really, they're too good for Jerusalem. But maybe Madagascar. At any rate, that's Zionism of a kind, if you might say. That tendency, I may say, seems to have died out. Uh, pretty much now, any anti-Semite is also an anti-Zionist. That much is true. But there were, um, and there still is, an another tradition of the secular left, the Jewish Marxist uh, tendency, which is was one of the uh, great flourishings of the 20th century, that warned Abraham Leon was one of them in, in Belgium, who later died in Auschwitz, uh, that the project necessitated a quarrel with the Palestinian Arabs because of the land. Um, and Abraham Leon said it wouldn't matter to the Arab peasant in Palestine whether the occupiers were Belgian or English or Turkish or Egyptian. Uh, they would resist any attempt to take over their land. That, that, they, that their propaganda is sometimes anti-Jewish is, you might say, a second-order consideration. Some of you may have read Avishai Margalit, Isaiah Berlin's great disciple, who says, I can't do his accent, I wish I could. He's a brilliant guy, lives in Jerusalem, is a Zionist. But he says, the project is to turn the Jew from being the Luftmensch, the weightless man, the watchmaker in Budapest, into a sturdy farmer and soldier in uh, Palestine. Well, whether that project's a good one or not, it necessitates, as he emphasized, it necessitates a quarrel over the ownership of that land. Uh, a quarrel that will go on for generations. The theft of land, the annexation of land will not be forgiven, uh, whether it's by Jew or anyone else. And he says, some people, I, I, I'll try his voice. There are some who say that this is the Zionist original sin. In this I do not believe, says Avishai. I, I say rather it is the immaculate misconception so may the day never come when there are not anti-Zionist Jews. And may the day never come when it can't be said that of a criticism leveled at the Israeli state that it can only be motivated by the filthy prejudice that I'm here to talk about. Okay, is questioning the Holocaust anti-Semitic? You say I'm going to play for high stakes here. Not necessarily. Yes, if it denies that there was a plan, that there was a design, that there was a fully evolved intention traceable to the first publication of Mein Kampf for the erasure of European Jewry. To deny that is certainly to exhibit uh, toxic anti-Semitism. But there are many, many arguments about the numbers, about the locations. Uh, Yad Vashem, for example, the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem says four and a half million. Most people say six. Good for Yad Vashem for going on the low side. When we've dug up all the graves, because they haven't all been found yet, in Belarus, in parts of Yugoslavia recently, uh, some were found, and elsewhere. The figure may be much larger than we can bear to think, but it's a responsibility. We have to act as if everyone who perished in that was a precious person. It's a responsibility not to reduce it to propaganda, to be prepared to debate on it with people who say, well, it's not true, it isn't true, that, that Jews were ever made into soap. Uh, obviously, the Nazis were going to wash their hands in June. It's a fabrication by Stalin's anti-fascist Jewish committee. We should drop it. Um, and we should admit that there's propaganda involved here. Um, like the Armenian people who regularly debate with Turkish historians who deny what happened to their people. They show great dignity. They come back again with their historians to the fray. They say, no, we will have this out. We will not have this fetishized or propagandized. We have a duty to historical truth. So I don't believe that there should be any censorship or any intimidation of anyone, revisionist or even denier, who wants to bring forward any evidence. What do we think we lack? The confidence to win this argument? 
no, we can't have that said. So, I, I'm glad I've got that bit behind me, actually, I must say. But I feel it has to be uh, uttered. Um, is there left anti Zion, uh, excuse me, is there left anti Semitism, as there used not to be? Anti Semitism was so much the weapon of the right and of counter revolution. Um, Lenin said himself, anti Semitism is counter revolution. Um, that you would never have thought, or I would not have expected to see the day, when on supposedly liberal websites available in California, there would be stories about Israel stealing body parts for the market. Um, that's almost a precise replication of the Passover plot. I didn't expect to see that. I didn't expect to see in my home country um, leading leftist members of parliament and, and activists making common cause with the, with the Muslim Brotherhood, with Islamic Jihad, with the people who publish the protocols. I would, have thought, I, I would have thought it was unthinkable, but it's not. And given the, the immense contribution that the Jewish people have made to the liberal left in every society, uh, this seems to me almost the most painful of the insults that this prejudice is currently hurling against us. I take it, shall I say, but a bit more personally than some of the others. I'm used to it from Mosley. I don't care. I don't care about it from Jean-Marie Le Pen. I expect it from him. I, I, hate, I hate it spread on campus and on the left, and it really needs to be fought without pity uh, wherever it shows itself there. Um, can an anti-Semite make a true statement? Sometimes. Um, the Reverend Bailey Smith, uh, Jerry Falwell's sidekick, once said, Almighty God don't hear the prayers of a Jew. As far as my investigations go, that statement is confirmed. <laughs> I think it's the, only, it's the only one I've been able to find that is anti-Jewish in intention, but factually true in statement. Um, can anti-Semitism be amusing? To a limited extent, but an indispensable extent, yes. Um, you perhaps know the story of Abe and Solomon walking along together, and they see a church with a big sign that says, um, Jews for Jesus. $1,000 to any Jew who converts, who joins. And Abe takes a look and says, I'm going to go in, I'm going to try it. Solomon says, should I wait for you? He says, yeah, if you'd like. About an hour passes, Abe comes out. Solomon says, so? Abe said, no, I'm, I, I'm a Christian now. I see that point. I'm with, I'm with Jesus. I'm saved. And Solomon says, well, what, did they give you the thousand bucks up front? And Abe says, is that all you people ever think about? <laughs> so it can be funny. Um, can, you, can you suffer from anti-Semitism mildly? That's my question to Mel Gibson. With most people, it's impossible to have it a little bit. It takes over everything else. It sucks out all the oxygen in your, what's left of your brain. And your, and your system, and it, it, it becomes dominant. Can it be mild? As a matter of fact, I think it can. I mean, I've known two people of whom I think this is true. My beloved friend, Martin Amos, uh, wrote very amusingly about his father, Kingsley, who in late life became a bit of a curmudgeon. And he said to his dad once, Dad, what is this? Uh, what's it like being a, a mild anti-Semite? And his father said, oh, it's all right. Um, he said, it's, you know, it's when I'm watching the credits at the end of a film, and I think, oh, there goes another one. Uh, oh, and another one. Um, well, I can just assure you, the old man, he became a bit of a bore towards the end of his life. He wouldn't hurt a fly. And he certainly wouldn't hurt a Jew or have it done. Um, so in some way, I think it's, op I'm being optimistic. It's, it's a, it is a prejudice that can be domesticated, if you like, brought under control, <laughs> repressed a bit. My ex-friend, uh, Gore Vidal, once got a bad review in the New Republic for his novel, Lincoln. And the reviewer was Thomas Keneally, who I don't need to tell you about, the author of Schindler's List. And it wasn't as good a review as Gore thought he should have got. Or, as a matter of fact, as good a review as I would have given it. I think Lincoln is a wonderful novel. But Thomas Keneally got a letter from Gore Vidal saying, I see that the Jews cast around for someone who was reliably anti-me and made sure that the ancient tribe was vindicated in your poor notice of my novel. Keneally has the letter. Terribly depressing. 
mean, so petty, so cheap, so nasty, so deliberately hurtful, but not frightening. Contemptible, not frightening. Don't make a federal case every time I say to the ADL. You, know, you have to be able to tell what's dangerous, what's wicked, uh, what's toxic from what isn't. Um, is monotheism anti-Semitic? Um, yes, at least uh, two-thirds of it is, um, more or less by definition. The other, and that in numbers, that means a lot of people. The two that are plagiarized from Judaism, from the worst bits of Judaism, I would add. Um, why do I say this? Because any real Christian, any serious believing Christian, would give everything he owned to have a personal meeting with Jesus of Nazareth. Not, nothing, that, that, nothing more could be desired than that moment. They, they, they yearn for it, they, they thirst for it, they hunger for it. No serious Muslim could want anything more than to have met himself with the messenger of God, with the prophet Muhammad. Well, there were no Ukrainians around at that time. There were no Poles at the crucifixion. There were no Irish people in Mecca and Medina. There was only one people that's still around that met both these imposters and said, no, no sale, don't believe it. Do you think that's ever going to be forgiven? Of course it's not. Of course it'll never be forgiven. They saw Jesus of Nazareth and they spat in his face. They saw the prophet Muhammad and they said, this guy's just a warlord. And of Jesus they said, he's just a crackpot rabbi and also a great blasphemer. And Maimonides says one of his sharper passages our sages never did a better thing than when they got rid of that rabble-rousing imposter. Well, makes you proud, I hope. Um, you shouldn't want to be forgiven for getting a thing like that right. Um, but don't go to any mushy ecumenical outreach meetings with these people. It's a waste of time. My related question, can anti-Semitism, should it ever be considered flattering? Yes. Um, I think so. Um, the case that convinced Herzl that the Jews should leave Europe, uh, the case of uh, Colonel Alfred Dreyfus, um, led, after convulsing and s splitting France and French society and culture, to the coinage of the term intellectual to describe the pro-Dreyfusard faction. It was a term of contempt coined by the Action Francaise, the extreme anti-Semitic right party, by the Catholic Church, and by the bigots of the French army. Intellectual meant someone who was fundamentally unsound, who had no proper blood and soil connection with the organic society of France, who had no loyalties except to the mind and to inquiry, who was a doubter. Who was a, I hope that word intellectual never loses its association with those wonderful things. And to that extent, it's a product of the struggle against anti-Semitism, which is very much a projection of precisely that uh, conservative Pathology. It was Charles Maurras, the founder of Action Francaise, uh, T.S. Eliot's uh, favorite philosopher, favorite politician, who when he was finally jailed after the war for collaboration with the Nazis, as he was leaving the dock was heard to say, enfin, c'est la revanche de Dreyfus. Dreyfus is vindicated. Yeah, he was right. Um, and it was Eliot, the admirer of Maurras, who in his lecture not long after at the University of Virginia, famous lecture after Strange Gods, did not say that a healthy society should not have too many Jews in it. He's often quoted as saying that. He didn't say that. He said a too large number of free-thinking Jews is undesirable for a healthy, organic society. Well, from Eliot's Catholic fascist point of view, that's quite right. And it's the hope not just of Jews, but of many others, uh, that the free-thinking part prevails and that the bigotry does not. Um, Rebecca West, in her wonderful book, I hope you've all read Black Lamb, Grey Falcon, Journey Through the Balkans, just as Nazism is beginning to get going in pre-war Europe, uh, looking at the fractured, feudal, backward societies of what was then a sort of Yugoslavia, says, I quote directly, many primitive peoples must receive their first intimation of the toxic quality of thought from Jews. They know only the fortifying idea of religion. They see in Jews the effect of the tormenting and disintegrative idea of skepticism. And you think about what happened to Catholic 
Croatia, the organic, stable, millennial, unchanging society. The woman knew her place, the priest knew what, the priest was where everyone took their problems, the children were raised in the fear, the real fear of the risen Christ, and all outsiders were considered to be uh, vile. Imagine, uh, and, and then know what happened. Uh, she, she had it absolutely right. Jews aren't going to be forgiven for troubling the sleep of the peasantry and the feudal types who want to keep them that way. And nor should they want to be forgiven for it. They should be proud of the association. Here is Jacobo Timmerman, who I'm proud to say was my friend, the Argentine editor, uh, kidnapped editor of La Opinion in Buenos Aires in the 70s by the death squads and tortured in a secret prison about which he wrote a marvelous memoir that again I hope you've all read, Prisoner Without a Name, Cell Without a Number. Here's what his interrogator said to him between blows of the cattle prod. He said, Argentina has three main enemies. Karl Marx, because he tried to destroy the Christian concept of society. Sigmund Freud, because he tried to destroy the Christian concept of the family. And Albert Einstein, because he tried to destroy the Christian concept of time and space. <laughs> that should make you proud too, isn't it? I mean, none of those names are Irish. Um, <laughs> Victor Klemperer, final recommendation, if you have not read Victor Klemperer's Diaries of the Third Reich every, every day between 1933 and 1945, you should. Don't start them late at night. You will not get to bed. Uh, imperishable. The Winston Smith of Hitler's Europe. He had a friend, he, he minutes him, who, say, who said to Victor, you know, the Jews, we Jews, are a seismic people. A seismic people. It's an arresting phrase. Richard Klemperer hated being a Jew. He'd converted to Protestantism. He wrote incredibly disobligingly about Theodore Herzl. He would never go near a synagogue. But he was seismic in two senses. He could feel it coming, and he wrote an entry every day about what was coming to Germany and the, the amazing premonitions that he experienced. But seismic in another way in um, the Jews of Europe in having their own version of the Enlightenment, the Haskalah, named for the mind itself, and contributing so mightily on every front from psychiatry to physics to everybody else's enlightenment too. Don't think that's going to be forgiven. My friend Lawrence Krauss, Larry Krauss, the, I think the greatest living physicist apart from Stephen Hawking, gave a talk recently, which you can look up. It's called The Uni Whole Universe from Nothing. It's about the quantum theory, it's about the cosmos, it's about the Big Bang, and it's about the rather wonderful fact that everyone sitting here is made out of elements that were once stardust. Cheers you off and away. And he said, and I know he did it on purpose, he said, so forget Jesus dying for you, he says to the audience. Millions of stars had to die <laughs> before you could be born. Do you want to have a look at his mailbag? I know you do. And you know exactly what will have been said about a physicist who has not accepted Jesus Christ as his personal savior. There's a, I'm coming to the, the close of my remarks, and I hope I haven't overrun my time too much. <clears throat> and you've been very generous, but there's a, there's a very cryptic, but I think profound sentence in Leo Strauss's uh, 1962 essay, uh, Why We Remain Jewish. And I'll again quote directly from Leo Strauss's conclusion. He says, the Jewish people and their faith are the living witness for the absence of redemption. This one could say is the meaning of the chosen people. The Jews have chosen to prove the absence of redemption. Now, if I had to pick any one special trope of Judaism or the Jewish personality or character, I think I would pick irony. No other religion has a prophet like Maimonides who says, yes, the Messiah will come, but he may tarry. Uh, there are no Woody Allen theologians in Christianity who say things like that. For all the fetishization in Judaism of unleavened bread, the Jewish people have in fact been the yeast in an enormous number of societies and countries, the leaven in the, in the lump. Benny Morris's new book on the origins of the Israeli-Palestine crisis quotes one of the Mufti's people writing from the Imam's headquarters in Jerusalem to the British saying, you can't be bringing Jews into this country. They're all subversives. It's nothing but trouble. Um, again, uh, take the compliments where you can get them. Um, so, natural disturbers of the natural order. Everything was fine. Every, every peasant knew to expect only one meal a day. 
Everyone knew who owned what and where. Everyone obeyed the priests and the, and the, and the mullahs. But now look, these scrofulous troublemakers from Poland and Latvia. Rabbi Tarfon was a great hater of Christ Christians and an even greater hatred of, sorry, had an even greater hatred of Jewish um, heretics. And I've always thought it's wonderful that the word for a Jewish heretic, or the Jewish word for heretic, is Apicuros, follower of Epicurus, student of Greek. That's a nice way to be called a heretic. Anyway, I'm not a great admirer of Rabbi Tarfon, but he had it right when he said, he echoes Strauss in a way, when he says, you are not obliged to complete the task, but neither are you free to give it up or to evade it. To be Jewish is to be involved in a, a continual struggle, a continual test, to be at continual risk, to be always aware of anxiety and danger and angst, just as there could be, despite the best efforts of its enemies, no final solution to the so-called Jewish problem, Jewish question in Europe. So, one has to say, there's no ultimate security or salvation for the Jewish people or any other. More and more, for example, to me, Israel begins to resemble a part of the diaspora, not a solution to it or an alternative to it, just one other place where a large number of Jewish people live in great insecurity and constant doubt. Jews will always continue to be identified as malcontents, doubters, unsound, cosmopolitan, and yes, if you like, rootless. Um, and I'll close by saying this. Uh, because anti-Semitism is the godfather of racism and the gateway to tyranny and fascism and war, it is to be regarded not as the enemy of the Jewish people alone, but as the common enemy of humanity and of civilization and has to be fought against very tenaciously for that reason, most especially in its current most virulent form of Islamic Jihad. Daniel Pearl's revolting murderer was educated at the London School of Economics. Our Christmas bomber over Detroit was from a neighboring London college, the chair of the Islamic Student Society. Many pogroms against Jewish people are being reported from all over Europe today as I'm talking. And we can only expect this to get worse, and we must make sure our own defenses are not neglected. Our task is to call this filthy thing, this plague, this, this pest, by its right name, to make unceasing resistance to it, knowing all the time that it's probably ultimately ineradicable. And bearing in mind that its hatred towards us is a compliment, and resolving some of the time at any rate to do a bit more to deserve it. Thank you. I was asked if I'd want a moderator, and I said no, because I don't think anyone thinks I've planted anyone in this audience. So if you raise your hands, I'll, yes, sir. There's a roving mic for you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I ask this question, uh, not in a confrontational way, but uh, as somebody who Bring is it on. deeply appreciative uh, of all uh, that I have learned uh, from you. As you have, uh, I could ask this about any religion, but let's focus on Judaism. Are there uh, some, any, aspects of Judaism which you uh, respect, admire, appreciate, and if so, what are they? Okay. Um, I mentioned one. The question was audible to all, I hope. Yeah. I mentioned one, which was the Judaism invites people to study its negation. I mean, I believe, with many others, that everything, Matthew Arnold, Leo Strauss, many others, everything is a choice, a struggle between Athens and Jerusalem. I'm with the Athenian side. I wish that the other side had won on Hanukkah and that Jews had become the vectors of Greek philosophy in the world. I think that would have been wonderful. I think it's a real shame the Maccabees won that time. If, be, if they hadn't won, there'd be no Christianity and no Islam. We could have skipped the whole bloody thing. <laughs> um, and so I'm impressed, though, that the Orthodox say, here's what you mustn't believe. And they told them to study Greek and not to become Apicuros. Very few religions are as, are as are generous as that. And it's a tribute to the skepticism um, and the constant doubt that is involved and is, I think, necessary, by the way, for survival and probably is one of the reasons 
why this tribe did survive so, so much and for so long, that it, it, it did, in, in a way, keep an open mind as well as a great discipline and tradition. Then um, Jews don't proselytize much. Among other Jews, they do. The Lubavitch do, for example. Um, but they generally don't. Um, but what always alarms me about Christians and Muslims is they say, we have this wonderful secret. Uh, we have a personal God who really loves us, and if you believe in him, if I, since I believe in him, I'm going to be saved. In fact, I'm not even going to die. And you'd think that would make them happy. But it doesn't. They can't be happy until you believe it too. By force. Well, fuck that. I haven't got a minute of my life to spend being proselytized by these riffraff. And then third, the Jews don't make the elementary stupid mistake of saying the Messiah's already come. So, and they do well in exile. Um, and as I say, I mean, I think they found another exile in Palestine, and I don't think that the irony of that has quite yet sunk in, but I think that it will. Oh, sir, excuse me, I didn't see your hand. Thank you for being here. Um, Pleasure. My question is, I worry about the idea of a degree of anti-Semitism that you mentioned uh, in the middle part of your lecture. Um, I mean, how does one know the difference between harmful and harmless anti-Semitism, and also wouldn't the harmless people be uh, the rats in the plague in the sewer analogy that you used? Well, of course, the, the people who, so to say, have it mildly could become the gullible victims of someone who is much less scrupulous. That's possible. But I do think it's worth making the distinction. That's why I took the risk of showing you the hideous visage of Mr. Gibson, because you see there someone who's really got it bad, and you can tell the real thing. And I happen to know the backstory, so I, I thought I'd start off like that. I mean, I know where it comes from. Um, people who say well, that's what you get for giving your money to Bernie Madoff, for example, are probably not going to kill you. By the way, anyone who says, did you say your name was Madoff? Oh, then in that case, you can have my money. Um, probably does deserve a pasting. <laughs> but it's actually very, while I'm on this subject, it's quite surprising. There was a time in America when a thing like that would have led to quite a lot, I think, of public and um, unofficial anti-Jewish feeling. It, it really hasn't. And I believe I know why, because almost everyone in the United States now has a Jewish friend. Um, many, many, many people have uh, a Jew somewhere in their family. They know not to generalize, which wasn't true in the old days uh, to the same extent. Um, and I, I, think, I have a feeling that in the United States it's, it's very well controlled, so to say. Um, I'm not going to say this is the promised land, but um, I think that it, it should be a great Jewish project to keep the secular constitutional democracy of, of the United States going. So, given that I do believe that the prejudice is ineradicable because it, 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 it appeals to the pseudo-intellectual, to the conspiracy theorist, to the envious and the jealous person, to the gullible person, it has all these human faculties on its side, you're not going to get rid of it. I think it's important to pick your enemies with some care and distinction. Sorry, ma'am. I was wondering what you'd done with your women. You're next. <laughs> no, uh, sorry, next for the lady, please. Thank you. Um, you mentioned um, your concern or interest in the liberals yes. who you see as anti-Semitic. Having worked on the staff of both Martin Luther King and Jimmy Carter in the Civil Rights Movement and seeing some of those who, particularly Jimmy Carter as a case example, who would never have his picture taken with Dr. King while he was alive, and some in the liberal side of the Jewish community who didn't get involved, very, very, very few of us served on the front lines, try to take the civil rights movement situation with the underdog of the African Americans and put that into the Middle East where the Palestinians become the underdogs and the Jews become the racists. And do you think that may be a little overcompensation for the fact that at the time when there was such a clear thing going on in our country, very few people went on the front lines and didn't understand that the final stage was reconciliation. And if you look at the Palestinians, there's, you know, within the leadership, so few 
Hamas or whatever, the charters yeah. that want reconciliation. So how can you compare the civil rights experience in America or try to connect that to what's going on in Israel? And I, and I see that as mm. a huge problem on the left, yes. all good hearted, but completely wrong. Not all, not all of it good hearted, I'd say, but I, I think, yes, you, I think you identify the, the, sort of the allegorical problem quite well. There are people who are looking for analogy in those two situations and sometimes finding it, not just on the left, by the way, if you read Saul Bellow's novels, and nonfiction too. If you read Mr. Samler's Planet, and then you read his uh, To Jerusalem and Back, you'll see that he has almost exactly the same worries about confrontations with black power forces in Ocean Hills, Brownsville, in New York, or in Chicago, South Side, as he does about the Middle East. He, he feels it's a, an entangled question, and registers it, I might say, very, very finely some of the time, and I must say rather crudely, uh, I'm an admirer of his at other times. Um, the, the, it's a strange thing that in Northern Ireland, in the slums of Belfast, the Republican slums fly the flag of the PLO, and the Orange Ulster Unionists very often put up um, the Israeli flag. A, Conor Cruz O'Brien wrote a great book, perhaps you've read it, called The Siege, making a comparison between the three sort of post-colonial redoubts in the Third World, is Israel, South Africa, and Northern Ireland. All of these very uncomfortable associations to be having. Um, I don't think that that's the problem with the left, however, at the moment. I wish, I wish that that's all it was. What's happened with a lot of the left is that they genuinely think that Islamic jihadism is a movement of brown-skinned, disempowered people who've had a hard time. Um, and they, and they, if they're against the United States empire, they must be doing something right. So, and most of these people are fantastically ignorant. They know nothing about it. They've cared not at all to inform themselves. So if you say to them, actually, Al-Qaeda begins in India, Pakistan, as an attempt to destroy the brown-skinned multi-ethnic democracy of India by wrenching Kashmir out of the Indian state and starting a civil war, that it makes war on the other Asian democracies of the Philippines and Indonesia, in all cases, trying to build a separate ultra-fundamentalist Muslim state. They have no, they know that at all. Um, they just feel it must be owed something. And in several cases, including my old publisher, New Left Books, explicit texts have been produced saying that since the world proletariat turned out to be a bit of a disappointment, it never did what we asked of it, um, at least now there's an alternative source of power, uh, a mass disenfranchised uh, movement of resentment against. And lately I've noticed that um, Bin Laden's been getting this uh, and playing it back. He's been recommending to people that they read Noam Chomsky, for example. I don't know what Noam thinks when he reads this. <laughs> and he shouldn't be blamed for it. But they're trying to get more subtle about it too. These complete they, people who want homosexuals to be buried alive, who want women to be slaves, who want, you know the story, you know, you know what the Taliban is like, um, still think they might trick themselves out in some discarded left colors. It's a disgusting business. Symbolized in the recommendation of Michael Moore's films by the Al-Qaeda team. Very low cultural level. <laughs> Ma'am, here's the mic. Laryngitis. No, it's okay. Uh, thank you for a marvelously elucidative and erudite presentation, Christopher. Thank you. Uh, my question is Do you think that films such as An Education, which is up for several awards right now, uh, has a subliminal or perhaps a not so subliminal effect on the American psyche? I don't, I'm sorry to say, I don't know the movie you talk about. Movies aren't made for people like me anymore. I don't go. Oh, maybe. Um, but if, if you, if movies in general, well, you know what? I mean, the, the Passion of the Christ, for example, which I, I thought, I was amazed that something that was not just anti-Semitic, but was incitingly anti-Semitic, could be shown without protest. Uh, actually had practically no effect. I mean, the one or two churches in Kentucky put up a sign outside 
on Sunday saying the Jews killed our Lord. But that was about the limit of it. Most people don't remember now how dangerous it used to be to be a Jew in Boston on Easter time and be accused of being a Christ killer. Older Jewish people remember it very well. Younger Jews don't, and younger Christians don't. They aren't taught that anymore. It's, it's in a way encouraging. What, that's what nauseated me about Gibson, doing an end run around this and making sure it got to the Middle East with the ugly stuff put back in. Uh, and that's what shows what a little Nazi puke he is. And that's why I don't see how he's allowed to just walk around Los Angeles, if you don't mind my saying so. What is this? And how serious do you consider Farrakhan's rants and protestations against Jews to be against the Jewish people? Well, uh, two things about that. I, I remember once reading an account of, this is years ago, but I, I'm practically certain it was in a suburb of Los Angeles. There was an outbreak of swastika painting at a Jewish cemetery and on Jewish shops. And of course, huge kerfuffle, headlines, agony meetings, what's happening, all this stuff. They caught the hooligans who'd done it, who it turned out had no idea what a swastika was, didn't know about the Nazi party, uh, but just knew that if you do that, you always get attention. <laughs> you know, that upsets people, so let's go do that. Now, I don't think Farrakhan is quite in that category, because obviously he has a problem of belonging to a very debased form of sectarian Islam that takes part in a lot of anti-Jewish paranoia. But again, you see, if he had got up and said, at Madison Square Garden, where I was one of only two white people in the hall that night. Um, and actually, it wasn't, all, it wasn't at all threatening. It was unpleasant, but it wasn't, it wasn't threatening. But he made a huge tirade against the Jews. And if you remember, said, and I tell you now, Jews, when God puts you in the ovens, it's forever. That wasn't very nice to be sitting in the back. When that was but who cares what he says? Suppose he'd said, which would be true, the real enemy of black America is the Irish. They kept us out of the building trades. Their police kicked us around in every city in the country for years. Uh, they treated us like muck. They thought they'd become white and look down on us and so on. That would all be quite largely true. Do you think the Irish would give a damn? Of course they wouldn't. If they even heard him say it, they'd say, who gives a damn? It's Planet of the Apes. Who is this geezer? They wouldn't be hurt. No, but the Jews, what? A black guy? After all we've done for the black people? Yeah. <laughs> Wail, wail, kvetch, kvetch. There's no crying in Judaism. <laughs> Actually, unfortunately, there is too much crying in Judaism. So it works. So don't, in other words, don't get too easily hurt. Grow a thicker skin. Don't become insensitive, but stuff like that really is pathetic. And it shows the underdevelopment of his community and the miseducation that they've got from many of their preachers. I'm afraid I have to... My dear Armenian comrade. No, I, I have to recognize a distinguished Very member good. of the Armenian uh, parliament in Yerevan, Mr. Horanisyan, uh, whose father is a great ornament of this campus, <laughs> if, I'm not, if I mistake. Yeah, not. Yes, uh, he, my father and my professor, Richard Horanisyan, who gave me my lowest grade uh, when I was a student here at UCLA. So uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be sitting... Uh, uh, behind the former uh, foreign minister of the Kingdom of Thailand and, uh, oh, and among this very distinguished audience. Thank you very That's much nice. uh, for, uh, for the challenge you gave us. Uh, it's not only Jews or anti-Semites who uh, watch the film credits after a movie, it's the Armenians who also look for their IANs uh, to have some, se to some sense of identification. Uh, I, just, I just wanted to uh, ask you, uh, in the example of your own patrol of the frontier, uh, between civilization and tyranny, between uniqueness and universality. Uh, in the legacy of Daniel Pearl, and that's where we're here gathered to uh, give a modern application to, to that legacy, uh, how do you reconcile uh, the individual pain that each nation uh, feels? Uh, the Armenians, as you know, a generation before the Holocaust were subject to a genocide and a national dispossession. Uh, how do we maintain our own identity, our own pain, our own suffering, uh, but at the same time uh, allow for a universal uh, mainstreaming uh, so that the never again uh, is really never again for all of humanity? Thank you. Well, I don't, I'm afraid we can't say never again because the one, the one bit of the pastor of a Haggadah that I, I don't have any difficulty with says in every generation, 
it's going to happen. It's going to. There's no question about it. And I've given the reasons why I think that will be true and why it's an honor. Um, and though it's an awful thing to say that in the presence of people who suffered loss from it, I'd be doing them no favor if I pretended otherwise. Now, I have a quote here I didn't have time to read to you from someone who used to be a great heroine of mine, Rosa Luxemburg, um, one of the great Jewish thinkers and, and mobilizers of the 20th century. If she'd won in Germany, I think there would have been no, no Nazism, and, and for that reason, probably no Stalinism either. So it's, it's a tragedy. She's writing to her friend, um, Matilda Verm, from prison in 1917 when things are looking really bad, and she says, an anguished letter has come to her from Matilda Verm. Rosa replies, what do you want with these special Jewish pains? I feel as close to the wretched victims of the rubber plantations of Putumayo and the blacks of Africa with whose bodies the Europeans play ball. I have no special corner in my heart for the ghetto. I'm at home in the entire world where there are clouds and birds and human tears. Now, one wants to applaud that kind of internationalism and non-sectarianism, of course, but I don't quite do so. Because remember, this is a woman born in Poland, in Zamosh. She should have known by then that any sign of anti-Semitism is not that it's a sign that something bad is going to happen to the Jews. It's a sign that something very bad is going to happen to that society. It's an unfailing sign. I'm sorry, sir, I can't say that's true about Armenia. It is a particular tragedy. It was the first state-organized mass murder of the 20th century, planned and directed, and it'll be in our hearts always, as you, and you know, you can count on me. I've often appeared at your at meetings of the commemoration. But uh, it doesn't matter which society you take, the expulsion of the Jews from Spain immediately means the regression of Spain into a medieval barbarism. The expulsion of the Jews from the attempt to create a Jew-free Germany, I don't have to tell you. Um, the expulsion of the Jews from Iraq in 1948, 9, 50. There were more Jews in Baghdad than in Jerusalem when I was born. Uh, a ter terrific collapse, implosion of Iraqi society as a result. So we have no right, I think, to um, claim the special Jewish tears, if you want, but we have every right to say that anti-Semitism is not our problem, but it's a problem for civilization and it's the common enemy of humanity. And I think, I, I think that's the right balance to strike. And, I, and I'm, I am sorry to say that I don't think it's true of Rwandans, of uh, Irishmen, of um, gypsies, or anyone else to quite that extent, though of course all racism is poison. There's a, there's a mania, there's a, and there's a, there's a homicidal mania that lurks in anti-Semitism that really is a, a plague and, and needs to be fought with uh, humor and um, hatred. Two endlessly renewable energy sources in my case. <laughs> <clears throat>